This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. How are you doing today? Today's a great day. How are you? I'm doing great, even though we're having a rainy day. Yeah, that's okay. I don't mind the rain. It's a Monday and it's rainy, but you're going to tell me true crime. I am. So are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. All right. Well, I I got nothing else going on. (laughs) I know. Me either right now. What a coincidence. I know. So before I start the story, though, I'd just like to remind everyone to hit the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're listening to us on, and I'm going to tell you today's story. Please do. On the evening of August 28th, 1986, a man named Robert was driving on Route 11 in upstate New York. His headlights picked up a strange sight. There was a man sitting on the side of the roadway. Robert stopped his vehicle to see if he could help, and the man jumped up and ran over to him. He told Robert that he was headed to nearby Potsdam, New York, and needed a ride. Now, where's that in New York? Is that northern? Upstate. 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 Gotcha. Robert invited him inside the truck, and he introduced himself as Brian. Robert noticed Brian reeked of the smell of alcohol, but he seemed friendly, so he began the route to Potsdam. I'm usually friendly when I reek of the smell (laughs) of alcohol, too. He was shit-faced. Brian talked a lot during the drive and asked Robert if he wanted to smoke a joint with him. Why not? Robert declined and continued to listen to Brian recount his day. He had been drinking all day, had snorted some coke, and smoked weed, and had gotten into a fight with someone at a place called Chateau's Restaurant and Bar. The fight had started because the other man thought Brian had stolen $3 he had left on the bar. See, that's the shit that happens when you're shit-faced. Right. The guy left his three bucks on the bar and walked away, and then when he came back, it was gone, and he accused Brian of stealing it. The fight ensued, and Brian claimed he shot the man in his leg and said something to the effect of, the guy would be dead by 4 a.m. That's the kind of guy I want in my truck with me. (laughs) You can imagine how Robert must feel. Brian told Robert he was packing heat, in the oh. form of a 25 caliber and 357 caliber Magnum handguns. And he asked Robert if he wanted to see. No, I'm good. Again, yeah. Again, Robert was like, mm, I'm good. Don't want any of your joint. Don't want to see your guns. And all that Robert could think about at this point was getting Brian out of his vehicle. Hell yeah. I feel like, <laughs> isn't this where you, isn't this your stop? Hey, we're at Potsdam. <laughs> Hop out. The pair soon entered the city limits of Potsdam, and thank Robert, God. thank God, Robert was like, finally, and Robert dropped Brian off. Robert watched him disappear into the crowd of college-aged restaurant and bar attendees, because it's in the evening. Robert was really weirded out by this encounter with the man named Brian, and instead of continuing on his original route, he decided to head toward the nearest New York State Police Station. Wow, that is awesome. So many of our stories, nobody ever does anything. I know, Robert's like, "Mm mm-mm, this guy was weird. They see the weirdest shit and they just keep (laughs) moving on. Exactly. And it was about a few minutes to 11 p.m. Robert relayed his encounter to a trooper and they had him write it out in a statement. They hadn't gotten any calls regarding an altercation or shots fired at any restaurant or bar nearby. Even though Robert didn't have a detailed description of Brian, the state police did notify Potsdam police to keep a lookout for anyone resembling Robert's description of the man. The man was mid-twenties, medium build, dark hair, a scruffy beard, and he was wearing a dark colored jacket and beige work boots. The Potsdam Police Department received the report, and it was business as usual, for this small town's police force. 
That is until an emergency call came in at 3.41 a.m. The call came from a guard at Clarkson University. The security guard, his name was Kim Aveda Dickian. And if I'm saying that wrong, I apologize. You are. I'm just guessing. (laughs) And he said that a girl had been raped and injured and needed help right away. Kim said the girl was on the service road next to Walker Arena, where Clarkson's championship hockey team played. So they're on the campus. Where is this university? Potsdam. Oh, it is in Potsdam. Yeah, it's in Potsdam. Three patrolmen and a sergeant headed out to the arena. They got there in under a minute because the police station was only about a half a mile from the campus. Kim pointed in the direction of where the young woman was laying She was laying on the ground and also drew the cops attention to the arena's metal staircase that reached the second floor of the arena. Like it was an outside metal staircase. And they noticed a man crouching underneath the staircase. Two officers headed toward the woman and the other two headed toward the guy under the stairs. When they got to the woman, they found her face up and she wasn't moving. Her face was swollen and bruised, and she had blood coming from a cut on her head. All she was wearing was a sweater and a blouse that had been pulled up over her breasts, leading the police to believe that she had been raped. There was a second security guard, Donald Shanty, and he was holding the woman's head as he was bent over her. He said that he and Kim heard a loud noise outside of the arena and were checking it out when they found the woman. She had been making gurgling noises, so Donald ran over to her and turned and cradled her head in the hopes that she wouldn't choke on her own blood. One of the Potsdam police officers called dispatch and asked that they contact the police chief as well as two investigators because he was afraid that the girl may not survive. An officer put a blanket over the woman, and two state troopers also arrived on the scene. One started to photograph everything. Police found on the girl a student ID, naming her as 21-year-old Catherine Ryan. At this point, the officers that had approached the man under the arena steps had cornered him. He was laying on his stomach under the staircase, and one officer grabbed his shirt and dragged him out from underneath. He appeared to be in his mid-twenties with a scraggly beard, wearing a dark jacket, jeans, and Timberland work boots. The officer turned him on his side, and the man shouted that his back was injured. He was hurt. The officer turned him back on his stomach and noticed there was blood on the man's T-shirt. They found his wallet and his ID in his back jeans pocket, and he was 24-year-old Brian McCarthy. They asked him where he was hurt, and he pointed to his shoulders and told the officers that he had been attacked by a man wearing a black jacket as he was trying to help the girl. Oh, I see where this one's going already. Go bullshit. Bullshit. We're going to call him Brian Bullshit. (laughs) Or Bullshit Brian. Yeah, Bullshit Brian. (laughs) Help me, help me, I've been attacked. I was trying to help a girl and someone attacked me. Fucking pussy. I know, asshole. Ambulances were called for both Catherine and Brian, and the first who arrived took Catherine to the emergency room. By then, her breathing was labored, Her pulse was weak, and her eyes were dilated and non-responsive to light. On the way to the hospital at 3.51 a.m., she stopped breathing, and the emergency crew began CPR, inserting a breathing tube, and worked on her until they arrived at the hospital three minutes later. At the hospital, the emergency staff took over and were able to restart her heart and got her breathing again. The hospital staff collected her clothing and administered a rape kit, collecting blood and saliva samples. In addition to the rape kit, at 4 a.m., the second ambulance arrived with Brian, and this is about six minutes after her ambulance arrived to the hospital. He was strapped to a backboard, and he was wearing a neck brace. He was taken for x-rays. Back at the scene of the attack, police found the rest of Catherine's clothing her jeans, bra and panties, white socks, and shoes. They also found several items with her clothing, like money, a pack of cigarettes, matches, and a gold watch. While Catherine was being cared for at the hospital, 
the Potsdam police decided that her family should be informed of what happened. The police chief arrived at the hospital at 4.20 a.m. and found an empty office to make the call to Catherine's family. He was joined by one of the ER doctors. After making the call, the chief came out of the office and told his officers that the woman who'd been attacked was not Catherine Ryan. What? I know. Catherine's mom had answered the chief's initial call and said her daughter Catherine was in California. She confirmed this by making a call to Catherine after the chief called. However, Catherine's mom told the chief that her 19-year-old niece, Katie Hawelka, was a student at Clarkson University, and that she and Catherine looked alike. Katie must have borrowed Catherine's student ID to get into the bars near campus. Oh, no. I know. Wow, I didn't see that twist coming, Tanya. No, right. Terrible. About an hour or so later, the chief called Katie's parents' home after confirming with the university staff that Katie was indeed a student there and also confirming that she wasn't home at her off-campus apartment. The chief didn't want to make the same mistake he had previously, calling Catherine's family and probably giving them a heart attack. Katie's mother answered the phone in the home where she lived with Katie's younger siblings, her sister Carrie, and her 16-year-old brother, Joe Jr. They had an older sister, too, 21-year-old Betsy, but Betsy lived and worked in Florida. The call woke up Joe Jr. and Carrie, and they grew alarmed when they heard their mother, Terry, scream. They rushed to her room, and she told them that someone had attacked Katie on the Clarkson campus and that she needed to get to the hospital. Katie's parents were divorced, so Terry called Joe Sr. to tell him what had happened. Joe and his current wife, Donna, lived in Verona Beach, New York, and they promised they were headed to Terry's home in Syracuse immediately, which was about... 30 miles, or a 30 to 35 minute drive from their home. And the three of them could then drive to the hospital together. Joe Sr. and Donna arrived at Terry's home at 7.30 a.m. and they all drove to the hospital together. So this is about four hours after? Mm -hmm. So this is about three hours after she was found? Yes, roughly. During the drive, Terry felt like Joe Sr. was holding back something And later she would reflect on the ride to the hospital and think that Joe, who was a dentist, must have made calls and talked to the doctors at the hospital and found out that Katie wasn't in good shape. Before they left to go to the hospital, Joe Sr. called their daughter Betsy in Florida and told her she needed to take the first flight to Syracuse because Katie had been in an accident. He wouldn't tell her any other information. When they arrived at the hospital, they talked with a doctor treating Katie. He told them she was alive, but unconscious, and was hooked to life support. He told them Katie had suffered a severe beating to her head and upper body, and there was a real likelihood that if she did indeed survive, she would have permanent brain damage. It was too early at that point to know for sure, and they would have to run more tests. He gave them a little bit of hope when he told them that the medical staff noticed slight movement in one of Katie's pupils, indicating she may still have some brain activity. Her parents asked to see her, and the doctor said she was in the ICU, and visitors were limited to two at a time, and they could only stay for a short period of time. When her parents got to see her for the first time, they were aghast. Her nose was purple and swollen, with dark stitches running across the bridge, and the nose was packed with gauze to stop the bleeding. Her upper body bore violent bruises, covering most of her skin. Her eyes were closed, but they were also covered in dark purple bruises and were bulging from behind her eyelids. She was hooked to a ventilator that delivered much-needed oxygen to her brain and lungs. Her head had stitches as well, which closed the gash that she had had on her forehead. Terry was in absolute despair. I can't even... Imagine. Oh my God, right? No, can't. As she gazed at her precious middle daughter, she thought, Katie's a fighter. She has to pull through. Despite the optimism in her thoughts, Terry was also realistic and knew that if Katie did indeed survive, she would have a very long recovery ahead of her that could last months or even years. 
Katie's younger siblings were still at home and waited by the phone for any news of her medical condition. Betsy had arrived from Florida, and Carrie picked her up at the airport, informing her that Katie had been beaten and physically attacked. This caught Betsy off guard because she had been lied to, and she believed that Katie had been in an accident. She told Carrie she was going to go right to the hospital, but Carrie told her their parents had told she and Joe Jr. to stay at home. Betsy believed her parents would allow her to join them at the hospital since she was 21, but she was very dismayed when Joe Sr. told her to stay with her siblings and take care of them. So tell you a little bit about Katie. She was a student, as I mentioned, at Clarkson University, which is located in Potsdam, New York, which is upstate. She began college in the fall of 1985, and when she was asked why she chose to go to Clarkson, she said she wanted to go there because they had a strong business curriculum and that she wanted to continue to pave the way for other women to attend there as well. Clarkson had been a male-only college until 1964, and that's when it admitted its first undergraduate female students. She felt like she could be a part of reshaping the male traditions and stereotypes at the school. She was really excited to attend. The strong financial aid package she received from the school also didn't hurt. At the time Katie attended Clarkson, a new school president was being inaugurated. One of his main focuses was to help the students with their social lives and activities that weren't alcohol dependent. This was the focus because the New York legislature had recently changed the legal drinking age from 18 to 21 that fall. And it was common for students to borrow friends' IDs or have fake IDs in order for them to be able to get into the many bars that were around Clarkson's campus. Hell yeah. I know, right? Same thing was going on at Michigan State University's <laughs> campus when I went there. I know. <laughs> I've told you all the techniques I use to alter IDs back in my day. Absolutely. Plus, Windsor was right over the border. Windsor is very close to where we are. And the legal drinking age there was 19. Well, that's so far away when you're walking on campus. <laughs> that's true. You'd be amazed what a little tape in a phone book can do to an ID. I know bouncers were just like, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And you know, did you prep for it? Like, when's your birthday? Oh, yeah. What course. sign are you? Right? All Absolutely. that crap. What's your address? So anyway. But the problem is... By the time, you know, I made it to the third bar, I didn't fucking remember shit. <laughs> oh, what was my name? What? what? What's, What's my middle my name? Birthday again? <laughs> the law at the time was strange. It was illegal for bars and restaurants to serve underage drinkers, but it wasn't illegal for the underage drinker to consume the alcohol. So the kids would only get in trouble for having a fake ID. Katie was starting her sophomore year at Clarkson and was just getting settled in when she was attacked. As a matter of fact, her mother and younger sister Carrie had just driven up to Potsdam with her the day prior to her attack, and she hadn't even unpacked her belongings in the apartment she was sharing with friends. On August 29th, the day after Katie was brutally beaten, police conducted their first interview with Brian. He told them that the night of the attack, he had been walking by Walker Arena and had stopped to piss in the bushes nearby. As he was walking through the parking lot, he heard a woman scream. He stopped to listen, and he heard a couple more screams. Was he a student there? No. He turned the corner of the arena. He kept telling the police he saw a man in a black jacket with white around the cuffs. He said that he was then hit from behind by someone, and the next thing he remembers was when police found him under the steps, shining their flashlight in his face. He denied having sex with Katie or causing her any physical harm. The police noticed he was trying to hide one of his hands, and they asked to look at it. His right hand was swollen, specifically in the knuckles, and his index finger was purple. It looked an awful like injuries you would sustain if you had punched someone or something. So police asked him how he had gotten hurt. He said he had torn down part of a friend's apartment door. As police made a note to check out the door of the friend, Brian's interview was over. Later that day, he asked to change his statement and said he wanted to tell the truth about what he remembers. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. 
<sighs> this can be the truth. Uh-huh. And it's full of bullshit, too. FYI. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> they interviewed him again, gave him his Miranda rights again, and he told them another story of what happened. But before I tell you what that story was, we're going to take a break. Brian said he was walking past Walker Arena, and nearby he saw a guy and a girl together sitting on the grass. They were talking and laughing. Brian watched them until the two parted ways and said goodbye. Then he went to continue on to his original destination, which I don't know what he said. And that's when he nearly bumped into Katie. He didn't see her because she was squatting and peeing in a corner. And he didn't see her until he was basically on top of her. He said that she startled him. And he said, excuse me. And she said, it's okay. Katie hit her pants off of her right leg and wasn't wearing her right boot. Brian noticed blood on her, even though he didn't say where. Then he went to Katie and pushed her into the wall where she was peeing near And he tried to take advantage of her, is how he said it. He tried to rape her. Yes. Take advantage. Come on. I know. He didn't rape her because he couldn't. He specifically said, I tried, but I couldn't. And then just lost control. I went crazy, is how he put it. After about two to three minutes, a car turned into the parking lot and stopped for a moment. It drove off and came back again with two people inside. That was the security guards. One of the security guards had noticed and then went back to get the second one. The car left again, and Brian decided it would be a good time to leave, too. That's when the police showed up, and he hid under the stairs. The police weren't satisfied with this half-ass confession, so they asked to go back to when he said he pushed Katie into the wall. They knew more had to have happened, considering the extensive injuries she suffered. Brian expanded on his description of events. Katie had her back to him, and she was peeing in a corner, leaning on one of the walls. He sensed she was drunk and was staggering about a bit, and he went up behind her and pushed her face into the wall once, and then tried to rape her but couldn't get an erection. They then asked Brian if he hit her or kicked her, which he denied, and said that he dragged her body a ways and did drop her head pretty hard on the ground after which he saw blood coming from her head. They asked again about the guy he said he saw with the black jacket, and he gave a further description. The man was tall, about 6'1 or 6'2, with brown hair and dark pants, probably jeans, and the black jacket had stripes at the wrist like white cuffs with stripes on it. He overheard Katie talking to the man, and then they parted ways. The police asked Brian, did they leave on good terms? Brian said, no, the man yelled at Katie. Then he was asked, didn't you say before that they yelled goodbye to each other? And Brian said, yeah, the guy did, but then yelled and walked off angry looking. The officers had the impression he was just making shit up as he went along. They asked him again, how many times did you push Katie's face into the brick wall? And then he said, just one time. I didn't mean to do it. And then another time where he did mean to do it. He was trying to help her and get her out of the corner and then dropped her and her face hit the wall real hard. They asked if Katie said anything to him and she said, what are you doing? He admitted he was the only one who removed her clothing. He had pulled her shirt up and took her pants the rest of the way off. She was semi-conscious when he did this and was mumbling something that he couldn't make out. Police, again, still weren't happy with this description of the attack on Katie. Her injuries were just too much to have been caused by two bumps against the wall. He was asked again if he kicked her, and he finally admitted it. He didn't mean to kick her, but he was pissed off, and he was moving her, and he wanted her to get up, but she wouldn't or couldn't, and he kicked her, but he hadn't meant to do it. They pressed him again about whether he hit her with his fists, and he continued to deny He did that. Why doesn't he just come forward and say it? I mean, his goose is cooked. I know. You're killing me here. He needs to just tell us. I know. Can you imagine how the police felt? He finally said he didn't know why he did this, why he attacked Katie. He then admitted 
he had his whole weight behind him when he first slammed Katie's face into the wall. Oh, man. Running up to her when he did it and using both hands to push her head. Oh, fuck. I know. Into a brick wall. Oof. When he finished his story, he said that he was telling the truth now and he wasn't the only person to attack Katie that night. Because he's still on it with the guy in the black jacket. On Sunday, August 31st, three days after Katie was viciously and brutally attacked, hospital doctors told her parents there was nothing more they could do for Katie. Despite her heart continuing to beat and her lungs filling with oxygen, tests show she was brain dead. It would never again regain consciousness. In order to diagnose brain death, in New York at the time, the patient's pupils had to be fully dilated and not respond to light. Additionally, the patient's eyes would remain still despite being touched. And when the doctor injected cold water into the ear of the patient, the patient would have no reaction. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't either. That's weird. Very weird. So what would happen if I injected cold water into your ear? Uh, What's your reaction? Like, jerk? You'd probably be pissed. Yes. Oh, for sure, right? (laughs) (laughs) If I was unconscious, though, I would think that I would jerk or something, right? I don't know. Because it's a reflex, I would think. I don't don't know. know. I'm not a trained professional. I don't know. How cold is the water? But I thought that was kind of a strange test. There had to be absolutely no movement in the patient's body whatsoever. In Katie's case, doctors also ran an EEG, electroencephalogram, That when measuring her brain activity showed a flat line. The doctors told Terry and Joe Sr. that they would run one more EEG in the morning just to confirm brain death, which they believed would show the same result. They recommended that Katie's parents allow the hospital staff to turn off all the artificial life providing machines and that Katie be allowed to die on her own. All Terry could think about in this conversation was the miracle stories of people waking up after being in a coma for a long time. I know this would be a really, really hard decision to make. Those are some really cool stories, though. They are. I know. I don't know what I would do. The next morning, which was Monday, and it also happened to be Labor Day, doctors ran the second EEG test, and the results were the same as the previous test. Katie was legally brain dead. Terry and Joe Sr. had decided together that they were going to follow whatever advice the doctors would give them that morning. Terry inquired about Katie being an organ donor and was dismayed when doctors told her they weren't allowed to remove Katie's organs at the advice of their legal department. What? The fear was that Brian's defense would argue that Katie was still alive if her organs were donated and the recipients had her organs alive inside them. Oh my fucking God. <laughs> I know, Shut I was like, the fuck. Wow, that's up. creative. That is a creative defense. Come on. I know, right? In actuality, it wasn't the legal department that prevented Katie's organs from being harvested. Authorities wanted her body to be properly autopsied so that a cause of death could be determined. Terry and Joe asked the doctors if they could delay turning off life support until the whole family could be present at the hospital, and the doctors allowed that final wish. Katie's siblings were allowed to travel to the hospital, and at first Joe Jr. thought it must be a sign that Katie was getting better. But then the cold, hard truth hit him, and he understood that they were going to say goodbye When older family members asked him if he had ever thought that maybe Katie wasn't going to survive, by 1 p.m. on Monday, everyone was at the hospital, but Terry and Joe Sr. insisted that their children not be present when the machines were finally turned off. The family was taken to the hospital chapel when the machines were disconnected at 1.58 p.m. Doctors came to the chapel about 20 minutes later and told the family that Katie had passed and the official time of death was 2.16 p.m. Within the next hour, Brian would face an additional charge of murder in the second degree. At the time, you could only charge someone with first-degree murder if the victim was a police officer or prison guard. Oh, that's so strange. I know. Isn't that? That's bizarre. Soon after the Hawelka family returned to Terry's home, 
Joe Sr. asked his son to take a drive with him. They drove to a funeral home in the nearby town of Fayetteville. They went inside and the funeral director took details from Joe Sr., that is, until the talk turned to picking out a casket and gravestone. Joe Sr. excused himself to use the bathroom, and while he was away, the funeral director continued to discuss the final arrangements for Katie with her 16-year-old brother. Joe Jr. stopped him and told him they should wait for his dad to return to make these decisions, and the funeral director then told Joe Jr. that his father was in the bathroom because he couldn't handle doing this any longer and that Joe Jr. was going to have to finish. Joe Jr. based the decisions he made on what he thought his dad would approve of, and once they were done, Joe Sr. emerged from the bathroom and signed the appropriate documents. Then the father and son left. While in the car, Joe Sr. thanked his son for taking over, and in that afternoon, Joe Jr. lost whatever was left of his childhood. Now I'm going to tell you what Katie's autopsy showed. She had bruises on her forearms, typical of those that beating victims try to block when they're trying to block a punch or a kick. Bruises on her inner thighs, like those when caused trying to prevent being raped. Two black eyes. Her right index finger had a compound fracture, likely also caused in self-defense. Bruising to her face, neck, and shoulders. Fracture to her hyoid bone, which is very difficult to break when kicking or hitting someone. He tried to strangle her. Mm-hmm. And it usually only happens, like you said, in strangulation situations swelling and bleeding in Katie's throat and damage to her lungs. Her brain was examined and the medical examiner found bruising on the left frontal lobe, which, if it had been her only injury, would have probably left her with some impairment but wouldn't have caused her death. Her brain also showed neuronal necrosis, which means that oxygen didn't reach her brain and it died due to the lack of oxygen. The medical examiner determined that Katie was strangled manually, mostly due to the fact that there were no ligature marks and she had bruising on her neck. Strangulation also caused swelling and bleeding in her throat and the damage to her lungs. On the day of Katie's funeral, about 400 people showed up for a Catholic mass. Terry's mom wore all white and carried a single daisy, which was Katie's favorite flower. Her sister Betsy read a poem during the service that was one of Katie's favorites, and her sister Carrie brought a cassette of songs that had special meaning. Among the mourners were students from Clarkson University and the university president. When the family drove to the cemetery, Carrie played You Can't Always Get What You Want by the Rolling Stones. That's what I tell my kids all the time. (laughs) Whenever they whine about something, I start singing that song. (laughs) It drives them nuts. They hate that song. Do they? It's a great song. It was a nod to when the family had driven to Florida soon after Katie had gotten her driver's license. And when she drove, she always played Rolling Stones music. So by playing that song, it reminded the family of the happy memories they all shared. After the service, Terry invited everyone to her home. Terry told Katie's girlfriends that they could go into her room and take an item of clothing or another memento to remember her by. So I'm going to tell you what really happened. Katie had been out with friends, bar hopping, celebrating the end of summer and the start of another school year. As I told you, her mom and younger sister had dropped her off to her apartment earlier that day, helping her move in. As she was out that night, she ran into friends of hers. One of them was named Todd and they drank together at a bar named Boogie's until closing time, which was 2.30 a.m. Todd was wearing a black fraternity jacket that had white cuffs and stripes on the cuffs. After leaving the bar, Todd and Katie took their time walking back to the Clarkson campus and had to stop a couple of times. Katie had fractured her foot that summer, so it was still sore, so that was one of the reasons why they had to stop. And they also stopped so Todd could take a leak. When they got to Walker Arena, she told him she didn't want him to walk her all the way back to her place because it would have been too far of a walk for him, like walking her to her place and then walking back to his apartment. He asked her, are you sure you don't want me to walk you all the way? She said, yes, it's fine. So he left her at the gate to the fence that surrounded the arena. And when he left, in Todd's opinion, she was 
in a good enough condition to be able to walk to her apartment alone. About how far was she from her place? I don't think she was that far. I think it was probably less than a half a mile. It was definitely less than a mile. She just had to walk across the grounds of the arena, and her apartment was very close to that. Katie wasn't falling down drunk, and besides the limp she had due to her foot, she seemed okay. It had been at least an hour since her last drink, and she wasn't slurring her words. This is in Todd's opinion. And that night is something that is on Todd's mind, like while they're going through this whole funeral and everything. You know, he said he wonders why he just didn't insist on walking her all the way to her apartment. And when he asked her, are you sure you're okay? And she said, yeah, I'm on campus now. Everything's okay. Girl. Girl. Campus. I know. Scary people on campus, trust me. (laughs) Brian noticed Todd and Katie walking around 3.15 a.m. And he saw when they parted ways. He walked over to the entrance of the gate and was going to ambush her along the dark shortcut that she was planning on taking to get to her apartment. However, he didn't realize she had needed to pee and nearly bumped into her. He started walking away, abandoning his plan of attacking her, then changed his mind and charged at her, using his entire body weight to slam Katie's face into the wall. As she tried to fight him off, he beat her in the face with his fists and kicked her with his heavy Timberland boots until she no longer fought back. Then he raped her and strangled her. So she was raped? Yes. After Katie's death, her family sued Brian and Clarkson University for over $500 million. $250 million of it was they were suing Brian for. $150 million of it was suing the two security guards. And $150 million from the university. Brian was sued for assault, negligence, and wrongful death. The university and security guards were sued for gross negligence and or reckless conduct. The guards were negligent for not preventing or stopping the attack because they did see it in progress. One of them did and went back and got the other one. When they came back, Katie was alone in the field and Brian was under the stairs. But do they have a duty right. to protect and put themselves in harm's way? Right. Exactly. It's a difficult question. Well, you're going to tell me the answer. <laughs> the university was negligent for hiring incompetent security staff and for not giving them the proper training. Brian was eventually ordered to pay $3.5 million to the family, $1 million for lost wages, medical costs, and other expenses. 500000 of it was for Katie's pain and suffering, and $2 million for punitive damages. The university settled out of court. As part of the settlement, they agreed to upgrade campus security and issue a public apology for ever blaming Katie for what happened to her. Campus officials had referenced the fact that Katie had been out drinking until 3.30 a.m. and warned students about that kind of, quote, decision-making. End quote. Brian was charged with first degree rape and assault and second degree murder. He pled guilty to intentional murder and was sentenced to 23 years to life out of a possible maximum sentence of 25 years to life. And he has been eligible for parole seven times since then. Katie's siblings show up to every hearing and read statements and fight to keep him locked up. Her brother Joe Jr. commented an article I read from NNY360 where he said, the thing that always strikes the family is that Brian has no remorse about what he's done. He always tries to minimize his part in the crime and even called Katie Kathy Walker in a hearing. He didn't even know her name. Katie's family posts updates on the case. Brian's parole hearing status and instructions on how to submit letters to the Board of Parole on a group they made on Facebook called at the number four Katie Hawelka. Katie would have been 54 this year. So what do we know about Brian? Where is he from? Why was he getting picked up by a trucker? I think he was he was just out drinking. He was at the bar that night. One of the patrons did accuse him of stealing that $3 and he got into a fight. Did he shoot somebody in the leg? He did not shoot anybody, no. No. 
He did not shoot anybody. He didn't have the guns on him like he told Robert in their initial car ride. He was just shit-faced. When Robert dropped him off, he went into the bars and everything more, and he was drinking some more. I don't know why he was at Walker Arena, because he's kind of sketchy on giving the details. But when he did see Katie and Robert part ways, he did decide he was going to attack her and try to rape her. I think it's interesting that he had told that trucker that some guy was going to die by 4 a.m. Right. Isn't that crazy? And then Katie dies before 4 a.m. Right. I know. I thought about that. I thought that was just insane. And then Brian was from a decent family. His family did know some people in the Potsdam, New York Police Department, but that didn't really help him because he did commit these crimes. But I think it did help the police in getting a confession from him because he knew one of the higher ups at the police department. He says he doesn't know why he did it, that he just did it. Wow. Because he's an asshole. Exactly. Because he's a horrible human being. He's a horrible human being. And I find it interesting that he's been eligible for parole so many times and he hasn't been released. I'm sure her family will be very upset if he ever does get released. I got most of the information for this episode from a book I read called A Stranger Killed Katie by William D. LaRue. And Mr. LaRue is from the upstate New York area, I believe even Potsdam, and he just got really interested in this case. He was a journalist. Wow. And he decided to write this story. He interviewed her family. There's a lot of information in the book that I didn't include, but it was a really good book. Well, that was a real pisser. Yes. Poor Katie. And I decided to focus on Katie because I didn't want to give Brian the press. (laughs) Fuck him. I hope he stays. I know. I hope he stays in jail forever. And before we go, I would just like to remind everyone once more to please subscribe or follow on whatever app you're listening to, and then you'll get notifications when we have a new episode. That's great. And I love that feature. I do too. (laughs) And please, everyone, if you're interested in the story, I will post more information on our website, crimesandconsequences.com. There's also information about all of our episodes, so check it out. If you want to become a member and get exclusive episodes that are for subscribers slash members only, they're available on our Apple channel and on patreon.com slash TNT crimes. Check it out. We have over a hundred. And you can find the Apple channel just by going to our podcast in the podcast app on your iPhone. Look at how convenient that is. And there's just a button. When you bring it up, there's a button that says subscribe. Super, super easy. Super easy. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook. Our handle is at Hardcore True Crime. There's all kinds of good stuff. Yes. too. And if you go to our website, crimesandconsequences.com, you can also see our merchandise we have available. And I'm wearing a sweatshirt today. I am staring at Tanya, who is literally wearing a sweatshirt that says Crimes and Consequences. I hate people. Because I hate people. I hate Brian. Mm -hmm. He deserves our hate. So... That's it. That's it. Till next week. That's my line. Before we go, we have shout outs, Talia. Oh, we got to do shout outs. So please hold your applause. Okay. Until the end. I'm doing my best. So we would love to thank our newest members, Brian M., Tawny J., Aaron B., Teresa E., Alice, Marilyn D., Bill S., Sharon N., Jordan D., Brandy L., Trinity M., Martha B., Chad H., Brittany K, Amanda M, Blue R, I think it's Blue. If I mispronounced it, please forgive me. How do you spell that? B L E A U. Like blue cheese? Like blue. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Blue I... cheese? I don't think blue cheese spelled it. I don't know. <laughs> I just have a law degree. I don't know how to spell. <laughs> Tiffany C, Eliana T, Athena G, Holly W, Jennifer H, Ryan, Andrew R, Ashley G, Kelly. Ashley O, and Carly P. I also want to add Alexandra, who subscribes to our Apple channel. And there are a couple hundred people that subscribe to our Apple channel that we don't know your name. So if you want shout outs, let us know. Yes, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Contact at crimesandconsequences.com. Is that everything? Good enough for me. All right. Until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.